Hi, I'm Vanessa, and I'm from the Strange Colony Podcast, and this is True Crime Storytime. This week I am flying solo. My lovely partner in Not So Crime is unfortunately very unwell at the moment, so hope you get better soon, Jacinta, and hopefully she will be with us next week. Fingers crossed. Uh, it's definitely been a week for being sick. Even I'm still a little under the weather. So this week I am going to take us take us back in a little a bit a little bit of history. It's not quite a hundred years though, so you know, not too far back. And I'm going to tell you about the kidnapping and murder of Graham Thorne. Graham Frederick Hilton Thorne was born on the 18th of December 1951 in Sydney, New South Wales. He lived with his family in Bondi. And that was his mother, Frida, his father, Basil, and his sister, Belinda. And she was uh, all of three at the time all of this ish went down. I'm not gonna go too far back into like history and stuff like that. I'm just gonna like get into the guts of this. In the mornings during the school term, Graham would walk to the corners of Wellington and O'Brien streets. And they're about 300 meters from where he lives. And he would meet up with a family friend, Phyllis Smith. And she would walk with him to school with her boys. He'd usually get to the corner of the street at about 8.30 a.m. And uh, Mrs. Smith and her boys would get there five to ten minutes after him. On the morning of July 7th, 1960, Graham left his home as he usually did. But at 8.40, when Phyllis was at their usual meeting spot, he was nowhere to be seen. She, of course, went to the Thorn residence, just seeing if Graham was going to go to school that day. She didn't think anything, you know, too severe of it. But this surprised Frida, Graham's mother, as she had seen her son off that morning. The two women were a little bit worried, but still assuming that things were all good and he'd probably found another way to school. So Phyllis drove to the Scots College in Bellevue Hill where he was enrolled, but he was nowhere to be seen. It was then that Frida reported her, month, her son missing. The family only had to wait an hour to find out what had happened. Their household phone was called at 9.40 a.m. by a man with a foreign accent. Bondi police were already at the home. They'd been there for about 10 minutes. One of them, Sergeant Larry O'Shea, took the phone from Frida and spoke to the caller pretending to be Basil, as Basil was in Kempsey for business. This is a direct quote. I have your boy. I want £25,000 before 5 o'clock this afternoon. I'm not fooling. If I don't get the money before 5 o'clock, I'll feed the boy to the sharks. Ashe said to the caller he didn't think he could be able to come up with that amount of money. The caller said that he would call back at 5pm with more details, then hung up.
Not sure if you've clicked, but I'm guessing why you're wondering why a working class family living in a rental property in an average Australian town would attract such a person. In 1960, the construction of the iconic opera house was still underway, and it was more expensive than budgeted for. So the New South Wales government held lotteries to help raise the money. The first prize, £10,000, which would in roughly in today's money would be $3.1 million. Uh, and that was for Lottery 10, which was drawn on Wednesday, June 1st, 1960, and was won by Basil Thorne. This was before the idea that lottery winners would ever need uh, privacy or to remain anonymous. Identi identity concealment wasn't a thing. So images and private details were published in Sydney newspapers. They even printed when the prizes would be paid out. In this case, Thursday, July 7th, 1960. Sergeant O'Shea was unaware of this windfall when he had taken the ransom call. Not that it would have been enough to meet the ransomer's demands at any point. And he was already being inconsistent with his timelining. But anywho, the family waited and waited for that second call to happen. All while police were talking to whoever they could to try and figure out who would have taken Graham. 5 p.m. comes and goes. No call from the kidnapper. 6, 7, 8 p.m. pass by in the same manner. At 8.30 p.m. there is a public appeal made on TV. It was made by Police Commissioner Colin Delaney. And not a great deal has happened from that. At 9.47 p.m. the kidnapper finally calls the, the Thorn residence again. The phone was answered by a different officer, but they were still pretending to be Basil. This time, they tried to keep the, the caller on the phone long enough to, for a trace to happen. During the phone call, the kidnapper was saying to put the money in two paper bags, but then the call just suddenly ended without anything else. There was no further instructions. There was just nothing. The next day, on July 8th, they started searching the northeastern suburbs of Sydney as Graham's school case had been found in Seaforth. Later the same day, a tip came in about a sighting of the boy with two men and a woman in Pennant Hills. Some petrol station attendants say they saw the group in a dark coloured car around 10pm July 7th. It was a Dodge type sedan with no front number plate, but they did catch the rear number plate as they left. When police located the car, it sped off on them and checks revealed the plates were likely stolen. A few days later, on July 11th, Graham's school cap and contents of his school case were found nearby. This prompted a £5,000 reward. Another £15,000 was offered by two newspapers. And all the reward money did was bring in a whole lot of hoax calls, which made it just that much harder to find little Graham. So all the investigators had to go on was evidence since... All the witness sightings were just dead ends. So it was also down to like just old school police work, talking to neighbours, finding out what they've seen in the weeks leading up to the kidnapping. And a few weeks before the kidnapping, on Tuesday, June 14th, a foreign man, acting as an investigator, called the Thorn household asking for Mr Bogner and asked Frieda to confirm their phone number. And 
and a man who seemed foreign and matched the description of the accent had been seen in the park opposite the house weeks leading up to the kidnapping. So they're thinking this is the guy and they now have what they think is a confirmed sighting. It's also noted that at 8.20 a.m. on the morning of the kidnapping, a blue 1955 Ford Custom Line was seen double parking on the corner of Francis and Wellington Streets. Now, Wellington is one of the streets that Graham met Mrs. Phyllis on. So this is the corner opposite. Using the description of the car, police came up with a list of 5,000 cars that they should go investigate. They were assuming the car had been borrowed or stolen, so began interviewing owners, one by one. On Tuesday the 16th of August, which was almost six weeks after the kidnapping, and only 1.5 k's from where the school case was found, Young Graham Thorne's body was found, hidden on a vacant lot in Grandview Grove. He was identified by his father at the city morgue the next day. He was wrapped up in a blue tartan blanket, tucked into a ledge, then tied with string. He had been gagged with a scarf and was still in his school uniform. The bundle had been there for a while, but wasn't brought to the attention of authorities until two local children mentioned it to the parents who had reported it to the police on that Tuesday at around 7 p.m. Forensic analysis of the blanket provided manufacturing information. It was number 639 of 3000 of a run which was manufactured at Onkaparinga Mills in South Australia. And that run happened between June 6, 1955 and January 19, 1956. The blanket had been sold in Melbourne. In the blanket were also two different tree types, uh, a variety of cypress and a variety of false cypress, that were not present on the vacant land. There was also Pekingese and blonde hair. Graham's body had cuts and abrasions as well as internal trauma. The boy had died from asphyxiation or a skull fracture, but more than likely a combination of the two. After extensive forensic analysis, it was determined he had died within 24 hours of the kidnapping, then dumped soon after. Soil scrapings also showed that he had been stored under a house until his body was disposed of. Oh, wow. From the blanket and all the evidence gathered from it, police, oh, and those witness sightings from within a couple of weeks and the day of the kidnapping from around the neighbourhood, police now had an idea of what they were looking for. They needed a house with pink mortar, a blue car, and the two tree types found on the blanket. Now, cypress trees are pretty common, but the cypress and the false cypress together, that was pretty rare. A postman gave the police a tip off about a house in Clontarf, about one and a half k's from where the body was found. Police went to the house on Monday, the 3rd of October. The house had been occupied by a Hungarian immigrant named Stephen Bradley. Stephen Bradley had owned a 1955 Ford Custom Line in iridescent blue. And he had been interviewed originally with all the other people who owned one of those cars. He had a Pekingese as a family pet and his wife had dyed blonde hair. 
and his wife had been given a blanket as a gift that was the same as the one that Graham had been wrapped in. Unfortunately, Bradley had vacated the flat on July 7th and moved to Manly. On September 26th, a week before the police went to go question him, he and his family had left for London on the SS Himalaya. How convenient. When the ship docked at Colombo on Monday the 10th of October, two policemen from Sydney, Sergeants Brian Doyle and Jack Bateman, were already at the dock to meet Bradley. It took five weeks of uh, getting through some red tape, but he was extradited to Australia on November 18th in 1960. It's alleged he made a confession to Bateman verbally whilst on board the flight back to Sydney. The next day he signed a written confession, which he later retracted. Yay! Bradley's trial started on Monday the 20th of March 1961. He pled not guilty to murder. There were many witnesses who testified he was the man they had seen and he admitted to kidnapping. He said he posed as a driver and gave a story to young Graham Thorne that was believable enough to get him into the car. He hit him until he was unconscious, then wrapped him in the blanket and placed him in the boot of the car. He claimed by 3pm the boy had suffocated in there by accident. He had checked on him a few times throughout the day, though. And uh, forensics also disproved this, even if he hadn't been checked on and the boot opened frequently. The trial lasted nine days and Bradley was convicted and sentenced to penal servitude for life. Which was the maximum for murder in New South Wales at the time. Still is, I believe. And without being given a non-parole period, that is for life. Like, that is until you die. He, of course, lodged an appeal, which was heard two months later, and it was dismissed unanimously. Bradley served his time in Goulburn Jail, and he worked as a hospital orderly while in there. This was during a time period where inmates were definitely forced into labour. He had to be protected from other inmates whilst in there because he was a child killer. But nearly eight years later, he got an easy way out when he died of a heart attack on the 6th of October 1968 at the age of 42. Which I was mad at when I read, like so mad. I wanted this dude to suffer. Ra. It is said that he never showed any remorse for his crimes. And during the trial, it came out that his reasoning for doing the crime was to support his family. He had divorced his first wife. His second wife had given him a child. And she had died, albeit under some suspicious circumstances, but nothing was ever proven. And then his third wife brought two children to the relationship. So he had uh, three children to support. And he and his then wife's savings were dwindling. And there wasn't enough money to support them all. And this is, this is what he thought was a good idea to remedy that. Yeah. Take, take from another family to support my own family. Makes sense. So much sense. Such a family man. My theory is... I don't know. I don't even know what my theory is. Did he kill him on purpose? Did he die on accident? The police theorised that 
he killed Graham on purpose, which is why he got done for murder and not manslaughter. And they say that he did it because of the increasing media attention. Now, kidnapping for ransom had never been a thing in Australia before. This is Australia's very first kidnap for ransom. So there was a lot of media coverage about it and police say that he freaked out about it and killed Graham, which is very believable. (sighs) Honestly, I would, I would agree with that given that all the stuff was scattered so closely to his home. Like, to me, that's just a panicked person trying to ditch evidence. But I am also not an expert. Because of this case, um, Australian authorities had to come up with ways in order to deal with ransom for money and kidnapping and the like because we'd never previously seen these sorts of things. Lottery winners were given the option to remain anonymous and no longer had to have anything in printed media. It's sad that someone had to lose their life and someone so young for these changes to happen and reading this case it absolutely blows my mind that things that I've grown up with in my life having them be normal like being able to remain anonymous if you win the lottery was a foreign concept in the pretty recent past Oh, much to ponder. Uh, I was going to have a look at what happened to the family after that, but um, aside from Basil dying quite young in 1978, I think it's best to not really dig past that. Hopefully the family got on with their life. It's always rough to lose a child. (sighs) If you're on YouTube, give us a like, subscribe, comment down below your thoughts and opinions. We'd definitely love to hear them. If you would like to get in touch with us, we are on Instagram at Strange Colony 2.0. We're on Twitter, at Strange Colony. We're on Facebook, Strange Colony Podcast. We have TikTok, at Strange Colony Podcast. And there's always the good old email, strangecolony at gmail.com. And until next week, stay safe, stay sane. I love you. Bye-bye.